Hi everyone, so welcome back to another video working through some of the math behind quantum mechanics and this is going to be the last video in this series working up to the Feynman path integral and looking at some more of the math or the direct notation, the bra kit notation of how to get there. For a very quick summary of what I covered last time, um, I'm on this page here and we learnt that a measurement can disturb the system and collapse the state. So that is one of those fundamental things about quantum mechanics that actually uh, making a measurement will change what you're working with. It collapses the state of the quantum particle. Once an input state like this has been observed, say spin up, the output state is no longer the wave function but has been collapsed into spin up. And we spoke last time about these projections. So this here is an outer product where you have a ket and then a bra next to each other. Um, once a neutron emerges from the up channel, that means it was measured to be spin up, it's no longer in this input state anymore. It's now in the state represented by the up projection with the input state. This is now its collapse state here. We can use that to rewrite our probabilities of observing um, an up neutron. So if our input state is psi, our collapsed output state of being measured up is this, then our probabilities are these inner products here. So this is where we did leave off last time. We were talking about this experiment where we were recombining two channels and then in our combined channel we were getting 100% spin up which made us think that there was some memory that the quantum particles had where they could remember all the way back to what they were here and for some reason it hadn't been reset by this experiment in the middle which usually is, is what would happen. Um, so we've discovered that our mathematical way of representing um, you know, the probability of this added to the probability of this was not giving us this probability here. So there was something wrong with our mathematical approach with classical probability. Um, the fact was that the combined channels here could not be treated as just a mix of different neutrons, um, but we needed to devise some mathematical framework to represent that these neutrons here that have been combined are a superposition of spin left and spin right. So let's see how we're going to do that. So going back to our outer products, we use them to represent the act of measurement by applying this projection um, to our appropriate state. So these projection operators are going to be what we're going to use to represent essentially which channel the neutrons have passed through. Okay, we can mathematically represent combining these two states here by summing the measurement outer products together and acting on the ket state. The state prepared by properly combining the beams from the second analyzer is a coherent superposition of the eigenvectors of the second analyzer. So that's another way to say it, um, but it is this superposition that we're trying to represent mathematically. So using the sum of the x-aligned projection operators, that's just these here, what is the merge state after the SGX analyzer? So that's the second one. So which one of these options sums these two projection operators? Well, it looks to me like this one here is out on our bottom. This one here is the projection operator from the top. And that's all acting on our input ket state. Um, so this looks like the right answer to me and 87% of people agreed. Um, yeah, so then they just go through expanding the brackets here, there and you can see what you get. One important thing to remember is that if you sum all the possible outer products, um, which we have done here because there were only two possibilities, it creates an identity matrix. Essentially, it's like the number one. When you times one by anything, you, the state is unchanged. So we're able to sum over all these outer products without actually changing the input state. So now that we have our coherent superposition state emerging from the second analyzer, to calculate the probability of each measurement in the third analyzer requires taking the inner product with the possible output states and squaring their magnitude. So that's how we've been finding the probabilities is doing this inner product between the um, I guess collapsed state and 
what you're using um, and squaring the magnitude of that. Remember that the inner product is like the overlap between two things. So if there's a lot of overlap between two different things, there's a high probability of that occurring. I think that's sort of the way that I think of it. Okay, so in this case, um, this is our superposition here, and that's what we've learned to represent. It's the sum of these outer products with our, essentially our input state. So that's what it started as, it was spin up, and now we've got this superposition here with that. To get the probability, we'll take the inner product of this superposition with either spin up or spin down. So a question here, just to make sure we're on the right track, what path does this amplitude correspond to in the analyzer below? Okay, so let's have a look at it. We've got a spin left projection in the middle here, so it must be yellow path C. Started spin up, projection to the left, and then an inner product with spin up. So I would say that is path C. And 83% of people agree with me. Um, so you can have a little look at all of these if you still need a bit more clarification to you know match these paths which with the path that they're taking through the system um, but essentially the, all of this path is just represented in these four arrows here in our bra kit notation that's why it becomes quite handy to be able to write things down like this all right so when we go to calculate those probabilities which we expressed on the previous page um, so if you take that plus that the magnitude squared, um, you get four terms. You get two squared terms plus interference or cross terms. Now they're going to work through it here, but there's one um, thing to refresh your mind on or, or learn here, and that was on a previous page. And that's when you just, for example, are taking probabilities. Um, the squared absolute value is also written as the product of an inner product and its complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate of a inner product means you can either swap the order of the letters, so you can swap the bra and the kit, or you can put this little star on it which represents that it's the complex conjugate. Um, in more common terms, a complex conjugate means the sign of a complex value is flipped. So if say we had a complex number that was like two plus i, the complex conjugate of that would be 2 minus i. Um, so there's brilliant goes through a bit more of this complex conjugate stuff and how complex numbers relate to this quantum mechanics in one of the previous courses. It's called unavoidable complexity. But just for what we're going to do, know that um, the squared absolute magnitude here can be rewritten as an inner product times its complex conjugate. So when we go to expand this probability, we have our two squared terms and then our two cross terms are written out using that fact um, and writing the complex conjugate times an inner product as a way instead of writing the squared absolute magnitude. It says here that our cross terms, which I guess are these two, could be positive or negative. We don't really know. So this is our probability for the spin up. Um, I think it says that for the probability of being spinned down, the interference terms which out, work out to be negative, causing the total probability to be zero, which seems quite interesting, um, and leads into, I guess, what is our final point. And I guess what it says, we've stumbled onto a way to sum the amplitudes over all possible paths, and we've seen it has a deep connection to the behavior of quantum objects. So really, we know that from our experiment, we were getting 100% of the neutrons emerging from the up channel and none from the down channel. But now we have you know, a positive probability for emerging from the up channel and zero probability of emerging from the down channel. Just coming out in the mathematics by summing over all the possible options. And that really gets into the heart of what is called the Feynman path integral or summing over all histories. Now the Feynman path integral is often represented in many different ways. You might have seen it or you might come to see it represented as an exponential or relating to an integral of the action of a system. 
but this is a way that we can see a glimpse of how it's working. We discovered that summing all the possible paths a neutron could have taken to the third analyzer resulted in interference. When we say that amplitudes interfere with one another, it means that they are reinforcing or cancelling each other out at various points for different measurements. In quantum mechanics, this approach is not limited to neutrons tra traveling through magnetic fields, but is a core part of quantum field theories for all particles. So that idea of constructive or destructive interference, you probably would have seen in waves, where like if the top of two waves are at the same point, you get a, an extra big wave. But if you have the top of a wave meeting the bottom of a wave, they cancel out to nothing and you'll get flat water. So that is essentially what's happening here with these particles, with our waves of probability in a way. When adding up all the possible paths for a neutron to take, the probability of it taking a detour to the edge of the universe and coming back will cancel out with the idea of it taking a detour in the other direction, the edge of the universe and coming back. All the paths that I guess stray from what you see classically end up cancelling each other out and that gives us our classical result that it is the highest probability because it is the one where there isn't destructive interference. So what we see in the world around us essentially emerges from quantum mechanics by the fact that even small deviations away from the path that we see classically will have very small probability amplitudes or will um, destructively cancel each other out and constructively give us what we do see as our classical path to have the highest probability amplitude by by far. Um, and this I think is a really cool aspect of physics and of quantum mechanics because path integrals, um, like I said, actually can also be expressed um, by calculating the action of a system, which is something I haven't spoken about, but comes into calculating I guess the path of least resistance or the path of least action through a system. And this is just where I wanted to get you guys to through this math for quantum mechanics series is seeing this um, emergence of the path integral because there is multiple different ways that I think you could derive it or come to understand it. So I'm going to leave this series here but there is so much more on Brilliant and on textbooks and online um, to continue your quantum physics journey but I hope this was a little bit of a boost to get you in the right direction in terms of some of the mathematics. As always if you do want to work through this material yourself on Brilliant you can. You can go to brilliant.org slash tibbies and sign up for free and the first 200 people that follow that link can get 20% off a premium annual subscription. So thanks to Brilliant for supporting this series and thank you guys for watching all the way to the end. Um, I've had a lot of fun here and learned a few things of my own. So I think I'm planning to do some more in this sort of style but not on quantum mechanics. So I'm open to suggestions. I was thinking maybe doing a bit of an intro to um, special relativity like uh, some more computer science stuff with neural networks or even a computational biology, which is, I guess, the area that's closest to what I'm working in. All right, so thanks for watching and I'll see you guys then.